I open this meeting of the Committee of the Whole Parliament to consider the Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill at Stage 2. For the duration of these proceedings, I am the convener of the committee. In dealing with amendments, members should have the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons or enter request to speak in the chat as soon as possible after I call the group. The Parliament is required to indicate formally that it is considered and agreed to each section of the Bill, so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. And members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And we move to the first grouping, entitled Quashing of Convictions, Convictions Considered by the High Court. I call Amendment 1 in the name of, Cab of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 15. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I have listened to the concerns raised by members around how Section 3 gives rise to unequal treatment in that those who protested their innocence the most would be penalised. If we were to leave in this section those who unsuccessfully contested their conviction on appeal or unsuccessfully sought leave to appeal would not have their convictions quashed, whereas those who in effect accepted their conviction and chose not to appeal or abandoned their appeal would have their convictions quashed. We also know now that in many appeal cases members of the judiciary will not have been aware of the horizon system issues at the time of appeal decisions. And even if an appeal was considered after the problems with horizon were known about, any convictions considered on appeal will have been subject to a different test than convictions which are quashed by this bill. These amendments will ensure that every person whose convictions meets the criteria of the bill will be treated equally and will have their convictions quashed, regardless of previous appeal decisions. I have always maintained that the best interests of sub-postmasters in Scotland lie at the heart of the bill. Uh, this is why I sought assurances from the UK Government Minister Kevin Hollenrake that this amendment, which deviates from the approach of the UK Government Bill, would not jeopardise sub-postmasters' access to the UK Compensation Scheme. The assurance that I received cleared the way for me to lodge these amendments and ensure that postmasters who previously sought to appeal their convictions are not treated less favourably than their peers. For these reasons, presiding officer, I ask members to support these amendments and I move Amendment 1. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to second these amendments and to speak to them this afternoon. I, in fact, submitted virtually identical amendments on precisely this point myself, as I indicated in my Stage 1 opening speech. Our amendments were lodged at exactly the same time, and so I was very pleased to be able to withdraw my own and support those in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I am pleased that the Government that has taken this decision to seek the removal of Section 3 of this Bill a section which is contrary both to the common sense and to the interests of, ju of justice. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the engagement I've had with her on this issue in the last couple of days. I understand that a similar provision in the parallel Westminster legislation regarding the Court of Appeal was included in compliance with the Constitutional Convention that the Houses of Parliament do not interfere with decisions of the senior courts. Quite where that leaves the latest Rwanda bill, which does nothing other than contradict the Supreme Court's finding of fact, I'm not quite sure. But be that as it may, in this place we can take such issues on their merits. The miscarriages of justice with which we are concerned today did not occur primarily because of a failure by Scottish courts to consider the evidence before them. They occurred because that evidence, unbeknownst to the courts, was not only flawed, but essentially fictitious. There is no reason to believe that the High Court, confronted by the same evidence, in the absence of the information we now have, would not have reached the same verdicts. There is therefore no principled reason 
for excluding cases considered by the High Court from the scope of this legislation. I was grateful to the Lord Advocate for her helpful reply to my question on this point last week. It's reassuring to know that, as she stated, and I quote, there have been no appeals in relation to cases refused by the Court of Appeal in Scotland. We did not hear, however, that there were no cases which might fall, fall within the other provisions of the section, particularly that which excludes cases where the High Court refused leave to appeal. It is better, therefore, in my view, to err on the side of caution and clarity and remove this section entirely. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for including these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Nothing further to add, President Officer. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We move to the next grouping, meaning of relevant offence, scope of affected person. persons. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Maggie Chapman, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Maggie Chapman to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to move the, amendment, uh, the amendments in my name in this group. As we have heard throughout the unfolding of this narrative, Injustices were inflicted not just on sub-postmasters themselves, but also their families, co-workers and the communities which they served. The Bill, as drafted, recognises this to some extent, but its inclusion not only of, it, its inclusion not only of those who are carrying, out, carrying on a post office business or had a contract of employment, but all who were working in a post office at the relevant time, that inclusion is important. But it is, I believe, necessary to go further, to ensure that the legislation includes others who may have been wrongly convicted but were not themselves working in a post office. Note specifically on, on the amendments regarding close relatives. Th these amendments addressed situations such as that which was referred to by Pauline, Mac Pauline McNeill in her question to the Cabinet Secretary last week, a case where, and I quote, a sub-postmaster was accused of defrauding £35,000, but to save his mother from jail, her son pled guilty to taking the cash that we know now did not go missing at all, and he was subsequently convicted. Without amendment, the amendments in this group, the son's conviction would stand. That is not justice. Speaking specifically of the amendments about co-accused, these amendments would ensure that the provisions of this bill would apply to a situation where two or more people were prosecuted and convicted together of an offence covered by this legislation, but not all of them were working in a post office at the time. Without this amendment, the effect of the bill would be to quash the conviction of the post office worker, but to leave their co-accused still, under the law, a convicted criminal. Again, that is not fair. So because of the injustice of these, I believe it's really, really important that we include the, these, these amendments. And I'll, 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 I'll end there. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Paul, Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 5 and other mem amendments in the group. Uh, Presiding Officer, similar to Maggie Chapman's, my amendments 5, 6, 11, 12 and 14 expand the provision for the exoneration of individuals to include that those who have a close connection with someone alleged to have committed an offence as the legislation previously describes. Uh, the case in question, Mr Nagy and his mother appeared in petition on petition in Greenock Sheriff Court on the 23rd of June 2009, and they were charged with the theft from the post office of £35,000. But Mr Naga was not employed officially at the post office at that time. He helped out where needed. He pled guilty as part of a plea deal that would see the charges against his, mother's, uh, his mother dropped, understandably. He did not work in the post office, and I don't think his conviction is covered by the bill. He pled guilty, even though innocent, to save his mother from a jail sentence and was given a community service or order. During that time, he contracted tuberculosis and almost died, had a pretty terrible time. But he is much a victim of the Horizon scandal as anyone else. And that's because... I appreciate this is one case, but members listening to, to this 
I hope were taken is the same principle as all other cases. And that is, as the policy memorandum states, that tainted evidence was used to convict and tainted evidence was used to get admissions from many others who might be covered by the Bill. But in this case, I will, yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm very, I'm very grateful for the member to take an intervention on that point. And isn't actually this the crux of the matter? That what we are looking at is tainted evidence, irrespective to whom that evidence was used against. And where there is tainted evidence that can't be relied on, then whoever it has affected should be able to seek remedy through this legislation. Colleen McNeill. Thank you to Martin Whitfield. And that is the salient point here that this bill is meant to capture the tainted evidence, i.e. horizon, that was used to convict people, whether it was an admission or not. He was charged along with his mother on a petition of stealing £35,000, which clearly didn't happen at all. Interestingly, their bank accounts weren't checked. This is a point that I raised um, in the debate on Tuesday, which is the veracity of these prosecutions need to be looked at because um, you would think that if £35,000 went missing, there would be some checks as to where the money went. Uh, page one of the policy document clearly states the bill is anticipated to have a positive impact on all those who have been impacted by the use of tainted evidence provided by the post office in criminal cases. What other case do members need other than to look at page one of the government's policy memorandum. We must make sure that no victims of this horrendous scandal are left to suffer from any loopholes in this legislation. I believe the bill would be defective, in my opinion, if it did not capture all the cases where tainted evidence was used. Yes, the appeal court is a route for all cases, and six have been heard and overturned, but the quickest and the safest way and the fairest way is to capture all those affected in this bill where tainted evidence was used to convict people. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I have a great deal of sympathy with these amendments um, and with this whole legislation. It's uh, been a long time coming and I restate you know, the commitment made by Beatrice Wishart last week um, towards the Lib Dem support for it. Um, I've been listening to the debate very carefully. I'm, I'm keen for some assurances from the Minister. Uh, I think my, my chief overriding concern is the unintended consequences to the balance struck in Section 2 required to be met uh, to clear the names of postmasters and submasters so that they are then allowed to seek compensation. Um, the bill, in my reading of it, covers, and, and I quote the presiding officer from the legislation, those who are carrying out post office duties, whether they were contracted to or otherwise. Um, I, I guess I'd be keen to hear from the minister as to whether she believes that condition is drawn widely enough to include the people that Pauline McNeill uh, rightly refers to. Um, so I, I draw my remarks to a close there. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer. There are many amendments in this, the, the largest group, so I will take my time to address them all. Uh, but I do want to start by saying that while I understand the uh, motivation uh, of Ms McNeill and Ms Chapman, that I am sorry to say that I cannot support um, any of the amendments in this group. And I want to start by uh, again reiterating the unprecedented nature of this bill which will result in convictions given by our independent courts being automatically quashed by an act of this parliament on the day after royal assent is given. And it is incumbent on us all not to threaten the balance struck in the conditions in section two, which are required to be met to exonerate those sub postmasters who suffered miscarriage of justice as a result of tainted horizon evidence. For a conviction to be quashed and for sub-postmasters to be able to seek compensation uh, from the UK Government scheme. President officer, I will start with amendments 6 and 14, which relate to condition C. The bill already captures all those carrying on post office business and also those working in the post office for the post office business and that is whether under a contract of employment or otherwise. So I can confirm the point raised by Mr Cole Hamilton that this condition is therefore already drawn widely enough 
to encompass those who may have been working with or helping out their friend or relative in the post office and whose actions may have been wrongfully penalised due to the faulty operation of the Horizon system. Amendment 14 seeks to... Yes, of course. Pauline McNeill. Um, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary giving way, and that was helpful, but I would like to confirm, is it the Cabinet Secretary's view, then, that cases such as myself and Maggie Chapman have referred to, where they were not employed, but they assisted, um, that they'd be covered by this provision, and even in circumstances, I would have thought, where the person pled, but pled on the basis of tainted evidence, which is the primary purpose of the bill, is the Cabinet Secretary saying these cases will be covered? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, bearing in mind, President Officer, that Ms McNeill has referenced a very specific and uh, what I believe to be um, a live case, um, she will appreciate that I have to keep my... Well, I'm not... You, you know I don't talk about individual um, cases, Ms, Ms McNeill, but let me um, repeat what I said, that it is my view uh, that the condition is already drawn widely enough to encompass those who may have been working with or helping out their friend or relative in the post office and whose actions may have been wrongfully penalised due to the faulty operation of the Horizon system. Uh, and therefore, if that condition um, is met, that convictions are automatically quashed. I will pick up on uh, the point um, again. Amendment 14 seeks to prescribe which family members may be caught by conditions. This may have the unintended consequence of limiting this condition in the way that it operates for family members to only those relatives. This is unnecessary and may indeed adversely impact some who would otherwise have their conviction quashed under the bill. It is not the relationship to the sub-postmaster that is important, but the fact that they were working in a post office for the purpose of a post office business, and this is whether under a contract of employment or not. Amendments 4, 5, 8, 10, 11, 12 and 13 would further extend the categories of people who would come within the ambit of the conditions without them having any connection to the work or the business of the post office. This removes an element that has been considered very necessary, that the person must have some link to the work or the business of the post office and not simply have a connection with the person who does. These amendments would open up a greater risk of automatically quashing convictions which are not in fact related to the aim of the bill, which is to capture horizon cases. In these situations which fall outside the criteria in the bill, there is still the right and correct mechanism for the cases to be considered by the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission for referral to the High Court. The Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission and Court would be able to consider the case and the link between the failures of the Horizon system and the offence. The Bill makes clear that it does not interfere with the powers of the High Court to quash convictions which do not meet the conditions in the Bill. The conditions in the Bill define the category of convictions within its scope which are intended to be unambiguous and therefore capable of being applied without any element of judgment or discretion. By adding in any further conditions, as these amendments would do, for example, referring to a close connection adds a layer of complexity and discretion. We have to remember that what we are doing here is unprecedented. And for this reason, it is important that Parliament as a whole decides what cases should be automatically quashed by this legislation and that this is clear on the face of the bill rather than opening up the possibility for Scottish ministers to exercise discretion in individual cases. It also carries a greater risk of sound convictions being quashed. For instance, it may cover a close relative stealing money from bank cards that the sub-postmaster is handling in a business or stealing goods from the post office and selling them on. There is an additional difficulty with amendments 5, 8, 11 and 12 
These amendments refer to close connection to be defined by Scottish ministers by regulation after the bill is passed. Presiding officer, this simply won't work. The bill quashes the convictions automatically on the day after royal assent. It has to be clear on the face of the bill whose convictions will be quashed. I also cannot support amendments 2, 3, 7 and 9 to include co-accused of those already covered in the bill. The co-accused do not meet the conditions which have been carefully drawn up to allow for this unprecedented step of automatically overturning convictions made in our independent courts through an act of this Parliament. Expanding the conditions to include them may lead to a situation of automatic quashing of a conviction where a co-accused was found guilty and the sub-postmaster found not guilty by the court. As I've highlighted for other amendments in this group, these amendments expanding the effect of the operation of the bill to co-accused would further extend the categories of people who would come within the ambit of the conditions without them having any connection to the work or business of the post office. This removes an element that has been considered necessary, that the person must have some link to the work or the business of the post office and not simply have a connection with a person who does. Presiding officer, any person whose conviction is not quashed by this legislation is of course left with a remedy as they are able to seek a referral eh, to the High Court through the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission. Again, I consider this the appropriate route for cases of this nature to allow for a fuller examination of the facts and circumstances eh, and not eh, automatic eh, exoneration. And I would eh, conclude, presiding officer, just by appealing for some eh, caution eh, by eh, members. Eh, I am concerned, as always, eh, about the impact and access to compensation because this would be a considerable departure uh, from the UK Government Bill. And the changes that we have made to date have been communicated openly and frankly uh, with the UK Government, uh, who have since replied uh, and agreed that there would be no consequence uh, to uh, compensation. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 2. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have listened carefully to the Cabinet Secretary's uh, position on, on the, two, the two, different, uh, grouping, two different sets of amendments in this group. On, on, on her position of the, the, the amendments from both Pauline McNeill and myself on extending the definition to include a family member, um, I am... I am partly persuaded by, by what she has said, and I, 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 I take, I take her, her, her view on, on that, but I would, I would hope that between now and stage three we can maybe have further conversations so I can be absolutely sure that nobody is going to, um, by accident, fall, fall, fall through the gaps on this. On, on, the other amendment, on the other sections, amendments that deal with co-accused, however, I, I am not persuaded. I think as I said in my speech at stage one, we know that this is unprecedented. We know that this kind of move that we take um, in emergency legislation to, seek to, convict, to quash convictions that our courts have made, that sh isn't a move we should be taking lightly. And I think it's quite clear that all of us are giving really serious consideration to this legislation. However, as Pauline McNeill has pointed out, and, and I said earlier, the point, of this bill, uh, the point of this bill is to quash convictions of people who were convicted on tainted evidence. And I fear that there are co-accused who have been convicted who would not be covered by this bill, and therefore I press Amendment 2. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. And as this is the first division off the stage, I will suspend for around five minutes to, to allow members to access the digital voting system.